Imagine the year is 2001. You're putting Blink-182's Take Off Your Pants and Jacket into your Sony Walkman. On your way to the local mom and pop game store to grab a new game for your PS2, clutching that copy of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 in your hands. As you approach the counter, the clerk asks you, Hey, do you know about the PlayStation Wars? Idly scanning the game as he presents you with this question. A few things rush through your mind quickly. With the GameCube's recent release making waves against the PS2, and the impending launch of Microsoft's first entry into the console market with the Xbox, is it about the generational battle between all these consoles that started with Sony a year earlier? Maybe it's a new reality show that's begun airing on MTV's late night block of programming, or has Grand Theft Auto 3 started some new controversy caused by concerned parents against violent video games? Unfortunately, the real answer is a bit more depressing. Welcome back to The Ethics of Video Games, a series where I look at how games are made and the very real impact they have on the world. It's not the happiest series I make on my channel, but one I personally think is important to make to shed some light on the media we all love to consume. This time, I want to look at the history of conflict minerals and console manufacturing. More specifically, the history of the PlayStation War that ravaged the Democratic Republic of the Congo for over two decades. Before we get into that though, Let's look at what goes into making a video game console, and why Conflict Minerals became such a seedy and swept under the rug staple of the industry. Video game consoles, and by extension a lot of electronics such as smartphones, personal computers, and even older hardwares like DVD players, all use a series of chips on or connected to a motherboard. Things like RAM, graphics integration, CPU cores, and so on, all soldered onto a circuit board to get things running as optimally as their designers would need or require of the technology of the time they built. This is a massively oversimplified explanation because diving in deeper would require its own video. Gaming consoles are different to something like personal computers though, since they are very purpose built for gaming. Even though the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One are designed to be all purpose multimedia consoles for people's homes, their first and main implementation is gaming. All of these require specific metals like gold, copper, lead, nickel, beryllium, coltan, and much, much more. But today I want to look at that last metal I mentioned, coltan. Short for Colombo tantalites, it is a serious powerhouse of a metal. When it's refined to its usable form we see in electronics, known as tantalum, it is a uniquely heat resistant metal that also conducts electricity very efficiently. The main use for it is in capacitors, components that store electrical charge. Seeing as most other metals will overheat and break down when storing electricity, you can see the desire for coltan in electronics. This is obviously very desirable for a lot of electronics manufacturers, who would like to have their devices last a lot longer, or at least long enough for the next cycle of releases. Remember the $1 billion mistake Microsoft made with the Xbox 360 that was the Red Ring of Death? While there's no official word from Microsoft themselves, some analysis has been made that has led people to believe the cause was a failure to dissipate heat properly, leading to serious and irreversible hardware damage. This is why minerals such as coltan are so important to electronics manufacturing. No one wants to repeat Microsoft's blunder that would have bankrupted almost any other company. This brings us to the question of the hour. Where is coltan obtained from? It's honestly hard to find the amount each country possesses due to conflicting information, but the main mining countries for the mineral are Australia, Brazil, Canada, and finally the Democratic Republic of the Congo. According to a BBC report in 2001, the DRC houses up to 80% of the world's supply underground. And in 2010, Joshua Kors wrote a report named Blood Mineral, citing their supply is around 64% of the world's reserve. This is either misinformation or a massive indictment of how much the electronics industry as a whole exploited the people and their minds in just a decade. Between the year 2000 and 2014, the supply of coltan on the global market from Australia dropped from around 45% to just 4%. The drop in supply in Australia can be attributed to the rising cost of extraction and an unfavourable exchange rate, making mining in Australia less desirable than, say, that seen in the DRC. The supply from the DRC in that time rose from 12% in 2000 to a massive 50%. Extraction was, and still is, done by hand panning, sifting through dirt and rock to find precious coltan. Of course, this isn't the reason it was desirable to obtain the heat-resistant metal from the DRC. 
No, the reason is what was dubbed in 2008 as the PlayStation War. The decades-long conflict that devastated the Congo is the deadliest war since World War II, but also one of the lesser-known conflicts that absolutely ravaged the country, killing approximately 5 million people and destroying the lives of millions more Congolese people. Just feet beneath the soil walked on in East Congo are enough minerals from gold to coltan to keep the electronics and defense industries operating for decades. And they have. Local and foreign militia have constantly fought over control of these mines, and are the source of a lot of conflict within the DRC, and with their neighboring country Rwanda. Many of those working in the mines are children. Around 30% of Congolese children are taken from school to work slave labor in the mines. A government willing to sell off its assets no matter the cost. Militia that have an iron grip over the local people, a large child labor workforce, and an insatiable tech industry in the middle of a giant boom is one hell of a deadly combination and also pretty good reason to keep a lot of their involvement hush hush. Leading to a lot of silence of the war throughout the years. It's also worth noting that the mining of these minerals as well as causing conflict that has led to the death of millions, destruction of even more ways of life, also contribute to the destruction of many native animals' habitats such as gorillas. I don't want to take away from the war atrocities and crimes against humanity that are committed within, but it is worth noting the destruction of environments and the effect of wildlife that it does have. But why the PlayStation War? Where did this term come from? Finding the exact origins of the name isn't all that easy. Considering if you search the words PlayStation and War on Google, you're met with a lot of God of War promotion, but in 2008, John Lasker wrote an article on TotalFreedom.org that stated, Recently the conflict has been given another name, the PlayStation War. In 1998, the world demand for coltan was skyrocketing, as household consumer electronics were becoming more and more desirable, raising the price from 45 USD a pound to its peak in 2001 of 275 USD per pound. According to Lasker's article, Sony's involvement and the market demand for the PlayStation 2 was becoming so high that their involvement is cited as a fairly significant contributor to the conflict over coltan mining and smelting within the DRC, hence the name. Video game manufacturing has a less than ideal history with conflict minerals. Conflict minerals in video game consoles are known as 3TG, consisting of tantalum, tin, tungsten, and gold, all obtainable from mines in war-torn countries. Each metal plays an important role in the production of consoles, so they're a necessity. It's just their acquisition that troubles a lot of the process. When countries known for their political unrest and militia groups fighting for control of the mines, it's easy to see how consoles and other electronics are funding these wars. Again though, why the PlayStation War and not the video game war. Like I stated in my hypothetical opener for this video, Xbox was gearing up for their first console and Nintendo's console was on the horizon. Well, of that generation, Sony's PlayStation 2 was by far the most successful. In fact, it still is to this day the highest selling console of all time. Released in 2000 and pushing around 155 million units worldwide in its 13 year lifespan, around 3 million of those in its first year. For comparison, Microsoft's Xbox launched in 2001, had a total lifetime sales of around 24 million, 1.5 million of those by the end of its first year. While the GameCube had a very successful year one of 4.7 million compared to the others, although its lifetime units are the lowest of the trio at around 21 million. While those sales are undoubtedly impressive and certainly played a part in a decades long conflict within the DRC and wars within other countries as well, it just didn't sit right with me when I learned it was dubbed the PlayStation War. When I started this video, it was originally going to be linking conflict minerals with console manufacturing. But the more I searched, the more I found links to Lasker's report and the nickname. At first I thought about how messed up the industry really must be considering how the video game market is the fastest growing entertainment medium of them all by a fairly large margin. But that's just the thing. Back then, it was without a doubt growing, but nowhere near the rate that it is today. None of this was making all that much sense. So let's go back in time again, this time to the year 1998. The rise of the home console gaming market was concerning parents with the rise of brutality in games like those seen in Mortal Kombat, Grand Theft Auto, and Doom. The home PC markets were ever increasing due to the accessibility of home internet lines through dial-up modems. 
Next, too close was the song of the year for some reason, dominating portable music players. Mobile phones were increasing in popularity as their availability became more widespread, and the VHS was going out of style in favour of something far higher in quality, the DVD. It was a very important turning point in home consumer electronics, and it was also the start of conflicts within the DRC. There's a very easy correlation to be made here. While countries like Brazil and Australia were leading the Coltan charge back then, as demand would increase over the years, that began to shift very quickly. As I said, the gaming console market was responsible for pushing millions of units containing 3TG minerals, but that doesn't paint the entire picture. Around this time, video games were seen as public enemy number one by concerned parents, and were like this years later when notorious lawyer Jack Thompson tried case after case against the industry. As well as those parents lobbying against games like Mass Effect for the depiction of sex, and any real-world violence was scapegoated heavily by any and all violent video games found in the perpetrators' rooms at the time. Games like Halo 3, GTA Vice City, Mortal Kombat, Call of Duty, and so on. What I'm getting at here is the 2000s were not kind to the public image of gaming. So when other consumer electronics like mobile phones, DVD and MP3 players were on the rise and using the same precious metals from the same sources were breaking through the market, what better distraction to investors and the public than video games? And namely the most popular at the time, the Sony PlayStation 2. The most popular mobile phone on the market at the time, the Nokia 3310, released in September 2000, selling 125 million units worldwide in just five years. DVD players which saw their first run in households in 1997 were becoming ever popular by around 2003, when their price dropped from $1,000 per to just 50. And let's not forget about the rise of portable music players like the iPod, releasing in 2001 and were selling around 2 million units by 2003. Now, am I absolving the games industry of all its blood minerals used within their manufacturing? Absolutely not. Any and all companies involved in their funding of conflict, death, and militia incursions all have the burden to bear. It's just that it was the perfect storm of new technology entering the market at a very pivotal point and needing something to point the finger at, all the while operating under the same shady practices as those they were directing the blame at. So this has been a very gloomy, gut-wrenching video, and for that I apologize. But I think looking at our past is important, so as we don't repeat these mistakes, but it's not all bad news. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act was passed in 2010 and implemented in 2012 by the US Secretary's Exchange Commission, meant any company publicly traded within the United States must declare where their minerals are obtained. This didn't stop trading within countries like the DRC, but it did make conflict mineral usage more common knowledge among consumers, allowing them more transparency in which companies they chose to support. Around this time in 2012, the Enough Project report came out, detailing the progress electronic companies have made in reducing their conflict mineral acquisitions. Among them, Microsoft have made the most progress with a 38% reduction, Sony at 27%, and Nintendo at, uh, <coughs> zero. Yeah, Nintendo were not great about their conflict minerals at all, until public outcry and petitions from many groups started circulating, calling for them to improve their practices. The process of verification requires manufacturers to use conflict-free smelters who source all their minerals from mines not affected or funded by conflict. Since Nintendo outsourced all of their hardware production, they were very hands-off in who was obtaining their metals. By 2017, things were improved a lot. Microsoft sat at around 99%, Sony at 87%, and Nintendo had a major leap up to 76%. Since Nintendo and Sony are not publicly traded within the United States, they are not under any obligation by the SEC to report their source of minerals. However, due to public pressure, they are known to release these reports from time to time. This video has focused a lot on the big three gaming console giants in the industry, but it's worth noting now that companies like Ubisoft, with their Toys to Lifeline, were 100% conflict mineral free. Producers of the Vive, HTC, have stated their policy on not obtaining minerals from conflict zones. Activision Blizzard, with their Skylanders line, saw around a 90% return of conflict free usage. Valve did not comment in 2018 about their reports, as they are not a publicly traded company. So what can you do in the meantime, aside from checking what electronics you use are conflict mineral free? What if you have some ill-gotten coltan sitting around the house somewhere? We are all guilty of that consumption after all. Well, most importantly, recycle your electronics properly. The three TG metals are all reusable, as well as many other components of electronics. 
The more that are back in circulation, the less that are needed from war-torn countries. That said, the conditions within ethically run mines are also not the best. The tin mine in Kachuba was labeling their resource as conflict-free before officially being so in 2017 due to the increased demand of ethical consumption. A lot of mines can meet their ethical standards by just housing safe environments and being child slave labor free. Nothing is needed from the standpoint of funding militias. And with the costs of taxes, materials, and so on falling on the miners who are making around $30 a day, most workers are working at a loss even within these so-called ethical mines. It's an extremely messy situation, one that has no easy solution, especially not one that I could provide. Things aren't exactly perfect right now, but they are improving at the very least, and that is always a positive sign. With the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 on the near horizon, it'll be interesting to see how these two companies fare, and with Nintendo's ever-increasing demand for the Switch, how they'll improve, as well as an increasing demand for ethically sourced consumer products. If you'd like to see things improve so that all companies are operating at 100% conflict mineral free, keep pressuring them. Let this video be the starting point of the solution, not the end of the story. With that said, Sony's next move will be one to watch closely as the PS5 production ramps up and their reports are filed next year.